There's not a lot to talk about in Buddhism. I think um, there's a lot to say, but not a lot to talk about. We don't have gods. I mean, there are beings that you might call gods, but they're not an object of worship or even really consideration in Buddhism except in passing as beings who have followed a certain path, reached a certain result. We don't have rituals that you must perform theories you must believe. Buddhism is about simplification. It's about reality. And an important part of reality is how simple it is. We talk about reality as opposed to conceptualization. And it turns out that pretty much pretty much everything we focus on in life is is at least mostly conceptualization. There's a concept in Buddhism called Papancha. Papancha. Papancha means making more out of something than it actually is. There's not a lot to talk about because there's not a lot that's real. Everything else is papancha. You take the five aggregates. These are one way of talking about what's real. And you can see how our ordinary perception of the five aggregates is almost entirely our conception of them. When we talk about body, we don't think immediately of the tactile sensations of tension or hardness or softness. Body. What is body? Body is this body with the hands and leg, arms and legs and trunk and head with its organs, its systems, its health, its life, its heat. The body is what walks and talks. This is how we think of the body. And this isn't real in Buddhism. This is all papancha. How do you know you have a body? You don't know you have a body. You extrapolate based on your experiences. When you open your eyes, not that you have eyes, but speaking conceptually, they're seeing, you see your hands, and you know that these are your hands. When you squeeze your hands, you feel this the, the pressure. You look down and you see your trunk and your legs. But the reality is all that is just seeing. You can turn on a television and see all sorts of things that aren't real. 
just because you see them doesn't mean they're actually there. Well, it doesn't matter. It's not. This isn't a, a discussion of whether your body exists or not. It exists, but it's not real. It exists as a concept, as an idea, as a description, if you will. It's just a way of describing it, and there are lots of different ways of describing our experiences, extrapolating from our experiences. But none of them touch on the base reality of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. That's what's actually happening. That's the reality of it. All the rest is is no better than an illusion. It has no more substance than a mirage. Uh, physicists have found that the majority of the vast majority of almost everything we see and uh, touch and feel physically that's solid is uh, almost entirely made up of empty space, right? which goes flies very much in the face of our conception of things. But they say it's real. I mean, uh, I. I I absolutely believe that that's the truth. No, don't, I'm not doubting physicists by any means. That just goes to show that there's no substance in perceptions. If you look at Vedana, feelings. We make more out of these than they actually are. We take pain to be a problem. We take pleasure to be a blessing. We have all sorts of narratives. Oh, I have arthritis. Um, chronic pain, headaches, or I get migraines, we will say. And we have a, an identification with the headache. I get headaches. I have a headache. Right? Even just calling it a headache is, is already too much. It's already some something extra. Because what is a headache? It's a thing. You've made it into a thing when it's actually just an experience. It's in fact moments of experience. And if you look closely enough and are careful enough, you see that even the moments of experience of the headache are individual. They come and they go and new ones arise. And our pleasure, oh, our, our pleasure, what we make out of it, the stories we make of the things we love and like, how many poems and books have been written about romance or friendship, family, food, sex, music, how we, what we make out of music Think, think of the theory that behind music, the musical theory and the work that goes into music. Think of the, the theater, theater that was designed to evoke emotion as a catharsis. This is this had meaning. So we 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 give meaning to things beyond what they actually have and the truth is these are just feelings pain is no worse than pleasure pleasure no better than pain better or worse are just ideas what are they good for? someone asked recently expressed the idea that they couldn't understand how how can pleasure not be good? In what sense is it good? 
What does it mean to say that something is good? I think the obvious answer would be, well, I like it. Liking something makes it good. Obviously not, but is liking any good? What good is liking? Well, liking makes you get the things you want. <laughs> and then you get more pleasure, which of course you like, and it's good somehow. There's no meaning behind this. There's no intrinsic meaning to any of this. It's illusion and delusion. It's not real. So before we get into, before we ever get into talking about the, the, the importance of this, the importance of understanding and the This is like that. But the actual recognition, that's where we make more out of it than it actually is. We say, oh yes, this is a beautiful woman, a beautiful man. Or we create a story, and give it meaning rather than simply appreciating the recognition or seeing the recognition for what it is, we make more out of it. And again, leads, of course, to many, many problems, especially relating to s Sankara, the next one. So Sankara is a bit of a catch-all. It has a lot in it. So Sankara is, there is least a bit to talk about, but it's not that complicated. It just means our mental factors, mental qualities. It includes thoughts, judgments, proliferations. This is where all the proliferations are. Talking about proliferations, they're real. The proliferations themselves are real, but that's all they are. They are just making more out of things than, than, the, than than things actually are, the, the making more, the meaning making or whatever is real, it really happens. But the meaning that we make is not real. The meaning itself is just an illusion, but that creation of illusion, that's in Sankara. 
one. So this is, of course, this is directly where the making more is. So we we give rise to thoughts about things, and to, to on a basic level, these are useful. It's useful to recognize, ah, yes, that's my mother, that's my father, that's my teacher. Uh, this is a poisonous plant. This is an edible plant. Mm. That's a poisonous snake. Being able to analyze and and consider things, being able to judge things, uh, being able to make conclusions based on our recognition of things. Oh, I recognize that spider. Okay, that one I'm going to stay away from because it's poisonous. On a basic level, they're useful, but we make more out of them than they actually are. Rather than use them just for practical purposes, we use them to create stories. We use them to feed our defilements, our, our unwholesome mental states, our mental illness, if you will, our neuroses. That's how they'd be talked about in the West. We might have fear phobias, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, anger, addiction. All of these are sankharas, and all of these bad, bad, bad things are, are not actually, in reality, that big of a deal. They're not actually that bad. They're just moments. I mean, they're, they're, they're not good for you. But they only become problems because we turn them into problems, because we reify them. Depression. I'm so depressed. I'm so bored. This is boring. Right? We go from saying uh, that I'm bored, which is real. Yes, there is boredom. To saying this is boring. We, we blame the experience. We accuse our experiences of our own boredom. You make me so angry. We blame the other person for making you angry. As if they could go into your brain and flip the switch to make your mind angry. If we could just see even anxiety and fear we could just see them for what they are uh, and be free from all these problems. They wouldn't none any of them be problems. We would no longer reify them, we would no longer feed them. We would just see them and let them come and let them go. And finally, consciousness. We make more out of consciousness than it actually is. Consciousness is the chief. Consciousness is another word you could say for experience. Maybe not exactly, but it, it's almost the same thing. Consciousness is, for all intents and purposes, experience. And this is the key, that our experiences are just experiences. Experiences of all these things that the Buddha talked about, the things I've talked about. When we apply mindfulness and we become present with our experiences, we free ourselves from all this baggage. Our perspective changes. We begin a long and arduous process of healing our minds, cleansing our minds, purifying our minds, bringing back innocence to our minds, freeing ourselves from the crippling weight of defilement, of unwholesomeness, of obsession, of proliferation, our illusions and delusions about 
reality. So there's a lot to say, but not a lot to talk about, and it's an important point that reality doesn't have a lot to it. So we try always to come back to bring ourselves back to this reality, to free ourselves from the entrapment of the infinite maze without end of conception because being illusory it has no end so that's the Dhamma for tonight <laughs>